Good morning. I want to uh, welcome everyone to the February 9th Executive Committee, uh, the Metropolitan Transit System. Let's go ahead and call the roll. Elo Rivera. Oh, can you speak into the mic, please? Present. Fletcher. Fletcher here. Hall. Hall here. Moreno. Moreno is absent. Bush. Bush here. Whitburn. Here. Chair, we have a quorum. All right. Do we have any requests for non-agendized public communications today? We do not, Chair. All right. Go down. I'll make a motion to approve the meetings minutes from the December 1st Executive Committee meeting. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any public comment? We do not. All right. Please call the roll. Oh, we do not need a roll call vote. All right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. That motion carries unanimously. Jump into our discussion items. First item, San Diego Transit Corporation pension investment status. This is an informational item only. No action for us to take. We'll turn over to Larry for presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Fletcher, members of the Executive Committee. My name is Larry Marinisi. I'm the Chief Financial Officer here at MTS. Um, today, we're going to go over uh, the San Diego Transit Pension Plan. And, and uh, before we get started with the presentation, um, I wanted to give a, a quick background uh, on the plan um, and really the current structure of MTS. And that's really twofold. We have MTS and San Diego Trolley employees are part of CalPERS. Um, those are the pension plans uh, for MTS and San Diego Trolley employees. CalPERS, as we know, is a very large pension pooled fund with many agencies that participate and uh, it manages pension benefits for more than 2 million California members. So the presentation today is really centric around the San Diego Transit Pension Plan, um, and that's for all San Diego Transit employees. It, excuse me, it's for transit, San Diego Transit employees. It's a private pension plan, and it funds uh, really three plans for uh, the ATU, the IBEW, and non-contract employees. There's about 1,570 active and retired members, and it does have a pension board, and it's made up of representatives from the ATU, IBEW, and non-contract employees. Um, the board is responsible for the application reviews, investment oversight, and the administration of the plan. Um, and the funding of the plan is shared by active employees and MTS each year. Um, the contribution of those funds are made up through an actuarial valuation report each year. So back in 2012, the plan was closed to non-contract employees through a collective bargaining agreement, which resulted in the MTS, <coughs> excuse me, it, re it resulted in the MTS board approved plan of continuing benefit payments for retirees and active members hired up to that date. So all new employees are in a defined contribution plan. So the board directed that the plan achieve 100% funded status within 25 years, which is in 2038. So the board, the bo MTS board's direction as it relates to the plan is to continue to pay benefits for retirees and eligible active members as they retire. <clears throat> and membership will continue to decrease given the fact that it is a closed plan. The board also asked that we achieve sustainability for 100% funded status by 2038. They also asked that as the markets are volatile, that we reduce the actuarial investment return target. Excuse me one moment. They ask that we smooth out the investment gain losses over a five year period of time to mitigate the, the large swings in contribution levels that happen on a year to year basis. And it really has proven to be successful. Um, we've actually moved the investment target from seven and a half percent to five to 6% in the last six years. And we are still on target to be 100% um, fully funded by 2038. So each year, today we're going to have two reports. The first is um, in the investment results for last fiscal year for 2022. Jerry, Jeremy Miller here from RVK will discuss that. And you'll see that we were a negative 10.8% for last fiscal year. But, and, then, and that is on the heels of the previous fiscal year. We were positive by 21.3%. 
And as I mentioned before, all gains and losses will be, will be smoothed out over a five-year period. We have a focus of mitigating risk and diversification will increase as um, we move forward. And Jeremy will talk more about that. And then in item number five, we will have Anna Harper from Chiron here to really talk about the actuarial investment um, results, not just from the investment performance, but also the other factors um, of the plan. As you can see that in the report, the contributions are projected to increase by about a million dollars or 5.8% for next fiscal year. And what we'll see in a chart that Anne will provide is that contributions will continue to increase over the next few years. And then you'll see a, a, a dwindling of those contribution levels. And then in 2038, you'll see a significant decrease in contributions by about $12 million to just under $1 million. And at that point, the unfunded actuary liability will be completely paid off and we'll only be paying the normal costs of the plan. So we have two presentations. Jeremy Mil Miller is here to discuss item number four, which is the investment report. And then Ann Harper will be here to discuss item number five, which is the actuarial valuation based on that performance. Jeremy? Thank you, Larry, and hello, everyone. As Larry mentioned, we'll walk through a fiscal year 20, uh, 2022 update. Um, as you saw, uh, Larry hit some of the punchline there, had a very good uh, fiscal year 2021 and a very difficult uh, fiscal year 2022. We'll walk through a little bit what happened there and uh, how we see things going forward, how you're doing so far in fiscal year 2023. First, we'll talk a little bit about the structure and get into some of the details of the portfolio. Uh, <clears throat> as Larry mentioned, this is a well-diversified plan across four different um, broad asset classes there, domestic equity, international, fixed income, and some multi-asset portfolios that allow for some opportunistic investing. Um, the plan, uh, the goal of course, is to maximize returns, but we need to assume a prudent level of risk. Um, and uh, one of the things that is key to understanding levels of risk that would be prudent would be to look at the liability structure. Obviously the assets are there to set, satisfy the needs of the liabilities. Um, and with the closed uh, plan uh, to non-management participants all the way back in 2011, 2012, um, we have continued to reduce the, the risk profile of the portfolio to align with that closed liability structure. And you can see that with some of those numbers we show back um, in 2011 versus 2022 and how that volatility number has come down and how you've gone from being um, an above average uh, risk plan to a below average risk plan. Now that means um, perhaps returns might not be as high, but you're going to uh, do a better job at aligning with your liabilities and keeping that risk profile down. Um, so again, for the liability structure, it's a mature plan with net outflows. Uh, and so we think it's prudent to be more conservative, diversified, and of course liquid to make sure that you can make those payments. Um, We've also um, spent some time looking at fees and finding ways we, that we can reduce fees. Uh, passive investing is one way that we've been able to do that. On the next slide, we walk through the details of that structure. So we um, go from broad asset classes down to the detailed products that are used. You can see uh, right here, 10 products uh, that we use to diversify across those four broader asset classes. And in particular with the active strategies, we try and make sure uh, that we have um, uh, controlled and um, allocations. And in other words, make sure we don't get too much risk with any, within any one active allocation. You'll also notice one addition uh, per our conversation um, last year, the ESG allocation has been added via the uh, Fidelity US Sustainable Index. So that um, is now in the portfolio. The next slide just looks at performance. Um, uh, as I'm sure most of you are well aware, uh, 2022 was a very difficult year. Rapidly rising inflation brought higher interest rates, um, which brought um, headwinds for markets. And we saw um, stocks and bonds move down together. That's often not the case. Often they move in different directions, but inflation is a case where that happens. Same thing happened. In, 70s and 80s when we had high inflation and rising rates led to difficult mo mo uh, 
moments for both your stock and your bond portfolio. And you can see the four quarters listed there, three of the four were negative, um, Q2 in particular, very negative. Your portfolio, your portfolio held up quite well though, again, more um, conservative portfolio. Um, and so it was down 10, its benchmark was down about 15. So there was some protection there through the various investments you have, your, your managers and your products did a good job at providing some level of protection during a very difficult market environment. Uh, so obviously with an assumed rate of return of six, you were well below it this year. As Larry mentioned, you were way above it last year. Markets again can be quite volatile and, and uh, that's why we're trying to uh, keep our eye on the long run, the strategic focus and make sure that you over time have the plan fully funded. Um, here we just break down some of the details uh, so you can see that again, that negative uh, 10.8, obviously one bad year can drag down a five and a 10 quite quickly. The 40 year still obviously looks quite good, but you can also see the breakdown across equities. Um, your domestic equity was down eight, international more, bonds again, down in lockstep with equities, very unusual. Um, but you did get some mitigation within domestic equity with your specific managers who provided some low volatility strategies that help protect, as well as your alternative managers uh, as well, beating both stocks and bonds. And in summary, um, we again are trying to stay strategically long run focused. We think your plan is well diversified across its broad asset classes and managers to do that. Um, we're gonna make sure that we work with your actuary to as, uh, align your assets with your liabilities and make sure that you have a portfolio um, that focuses on those liabilities, satisfying them and has an appropriate balance of appreciation and preservation to align with the closed nature of your plan. Uh, we're always uh, very mindful of fees and keeping those low. Uh, lower fees means more money um, to the participants. Um, and uh, thus far in 2023, uh, things have gone uh, quite well. Uh, that number was as of 1231, you've got another 5% in January, roughly. So thus far uh, in fiscal year 2023, you're at about 7%. So off to a good start thus far. I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Do we have any public comment or questions? We do not. Do you have any comments, questions? No? All right. All right. Can roll right into uh, item five. Yeah, once again, I'd like to invite uh, Ann, Ar Ann Harper up. Um, she's with Chiron and she's going to report on the actuarial valuation report. And this is going to be a representative of the investment return as well as other factors within the plan. And Ann, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, Larry for that introduction. With his um, briefing before our presentations, he's kind of stolen most of my thunder. But um, what I do want to go through today, um, since there are a lot of new board members and I haven't seen some of you since uh, COVID, so for maybe two or three years now, um, I'm going to give a little actuarial 101 for pension funding, um, just kind of an overview. Then we'll look at uh, the plan cost for the year when we did our actual actual valuation uh, to see what changed from last year's valuation. We'll look a little bit at the plan history and then uh, look at most importantly, the projections of the plan and where we are looking to go forward with the contributions and the funded status. So this is a standard uh, picture that if you can see in that very fine print has been around since 1965. And as actuaries, we have come up with nothing better to, <laughs> to explain pension funding, but this, this tank, if you will. So first and foremost, a pension fund is there to pay the plan benefits to the participants. And you can see that with the valve at the very bottom of the tank, there are benefits going out. That is the primary focus of a pension plan. So how do, how do you pay those benefits? Well, there are two things. There are the employer contributions and employee contributions on the left-hand side, and then also investment earnings. And those two things accumulate your assets into the pension fund. And then next, um, you, you have the tank here that uh, 
size of that tank represents your liabilities of the pension plan. And the liabilities are all of the uh, value of the benefits that have been accrued to date or have already been accrued. So those include uh, all the retiree benefits that are expected to be paid throughout their lifetime and active member benefits that have accrued uh, to the valuation date. So then the difference between the, the level of the tank and those level of the assets is your unfunded actuarial liability. So then when we look at the um, investment policy over to the right hand, top right hand side, the investment earnings coming into the plan, the investment policy really determines the rate of flow that is coming into the plan or it's the expected earnings on your assets each and every year. Um, then over to the left-hand side, the employee contributions are determined by bargaining groups, right? And by the bargaining process and negotiations. Whereas the employer contributions are determined by the, uh, the funding policy of the plan. And Larry spoke about that, where it's a closed plan, no new actives are coming into the plan. Um, and the plan is, is set to be fully funded and pay that unfunded accrued liability down by 2038. So, um, like I said, the funding policy determines the flow of those contributions. In general, you know, it's a pay me now or pay me later. If you have a uh, turn those valves up in the employer contribution in the short term, you're going to have you be able to turn those valves down over the long term. And that's really what your plan is focused to do is you have larger contributions in the next 15 years, and then we're expecting those to go down. Um, after that to just the normal cost. So you have an aggressive um, funding policy uh, to put those contributions in sooner rather than later. So just quickly um, to, to, to go over what the actuarial valuation process does is each and every year, we as the actuaries, we come in and we measure the size of that tank, the size of your liabilities. Did it change as we expected it to? Did people live longer? Did people get raises as they were expected to? And so that size of that tank can adjust. And then we also look at those investment earnings and did they come in as expected? Right now your plan is a 6% uh, expected return on your assets. Well, if you earn like two years ago, you earned, what was it, 27%? What we, or 27, yeah, 27%, 21% on your assets. What we do is we take that, as Larry said, and we don't recognize the full return above what's expected. We kind of have a savings, uh, if you will. And so what we do is we only recognize 20% of those returns above or below what is expected each and every year. So we smooth out those assets so that your contribution rates or you know, your contributions don't uh, fluctuate and or, so that they're more stable and less volatile. And so when we measure then the, the actual value of assets and the liabilities, we see if there's been any changes in your unfunded accrued liability. And if there is that employer, con the employer valve and the employer contributions either increases just a little bit or decreases a little bit, depending on the size of how that UAL has changed. And just to dive a little bit deeper into what your contribution is as the employer, there are three components. There's the normal cost, the UAL payment, and your administrative expenses. The normal cost is simply the cost of the active member benefits that are accruing during the year. So the actual philosophy is that since you're pre-funding the plan, you're gonna pay a little bit every year for each active member. So by the time that they retire, their entire benefit should be pre-funded if all of the assumptions are met. So that actuarial normal cost piece is just the cost of benefits occurring each and every year for the actives. And with your plan, since it's a closed plan, the aggregate normal cost of your plan is going down every year because there are fewer actives who are accruing benefits. Next, your unfunded accrued liability payment is, again, each time your unfunded accrued liability changes, uh, and we're not expecting that change, there's a new amortization layer, if you will, like refinancing your house, you have a new payment that goes towards that or a credit. And each year there's a new layer and that's a level dollar in your plan. It's, it's like a mortgage payment. Um, and all of these payments 
in your plan because of your funding policy will be paid off on or before uh, fiscal year ending 2038. So the total components of your the employer contribution are those normal costs, the total normal costs, the unfunded accrued liability payment, expected expenses, and then less any employee contributions that are being made by your members. So before I move on, is there any questions to the actuarial process? Okay, so this slide here shows the contribution reconciliation from last year's valuation to this year's valuation. This year's valuation is the June 30th, 2022 valuation and the contributions that we uh, determined for this valuation will be paid starting in fiscal year 2023 to 2024. There's like a, a like a one year lag in when we determine the contribution and when it actually gets paid. So the contribution is increasing by about $1 million. Um, $636,000 of that is the actual reliability experience at size of the tank actually increased more than we anticipated. And there's a, the, the salary and COLA experience that you see in the line item in the very end of the graph here should be up at the top and I apologize for that. Because the reason the liability experience increased by more than we anticipated was salary increases were higher than expected and also COLAs up for the retiree benefits were higher than expected because those COLAs are tied to inflation. And as everyone knows, inflation was much higher than we anticipated. So the good news is that your members and your retirees are um, getting have higher salaries to keep up with inflation and getting cost of living increases as well, but it is more expensive for the pension plan. The next uh, big driver of the increase uh, for your contribution was the actuarial investment experience, the asset experience. As Jeremy and Larry both said, the plan lost about 11% this year. Um, and if that were, if if that were the only loss, um, it would have been about a, a seven hundred thousand dollar increase to your contribution rate. But we do, like I said, smooth in gains and losses from previous years, and so the previous year's gain offset that. So the total increase to the contribution uh, on the actual value of assets was about five hundred thousand um, dollars. Fewer benefits are being earned in the plan every year by your active members. So that does decrease your normal cost. So it decreases your contribution and that this year it was about 150,000. And then there are just other demographic changes that uh, had some slight impact on the cost and it increased it by 53,000. So overall the contribution rate is going from 17.9 million to 18.9 million. Looking historically at what that contribution rate used to be, back in 2013, it was around 2 or 12.8 million. Um, and then in 2015, it actually decreased to 12 million. And you can see the bigger jumps in the contribution rate over the last six years. And that's um, due to that discount rate or assumed rate of return reducing from 7.5% now all the way down to 6%, which is a very, uh, very large decrease in the discount rate. It's like turning that investment valve, like like slowly turning it off, not off, but you know down. And so, what happens when you turn that valve down? You have to turn the employer contributions up, meaning there's those are the only two sources to fund the plan. And so, when you're expecting less returns, and the contribution rates have to um, have to be increased to account for that. So. The, just the, the, the changes in these assumptions actually has increased your contribution rates by about $4.5 million. This chart here shows the, uh, the funded status of the plan um, and the assets and the liabilities. Uh, the bars represent the total bar represents the uh, liability. The yellow lines rep or yellow bars represent the uh, assets. And so what we have with those gray bars is your unfunded accrued liability and everything on top, the colored bars also are part of that unfunded. And again, it just shows how based on reducing your assumed rate of return and also 
we had some changes in the mortality assumption years ago that increased the liabilities that has decreased your funded ratio. So the, from last year to this year, the funded ratio decreased from 58.7 to 58.1%. And that's on the actual value, actual value of assets basis. It's a little less than that on the market value because we still need to smooth in all of those losses from last year. Here we're looking at the member composition of the pension plan and just to show you the dynamics of how uh, it's changed over the last 10 years. Back in 2012, uh, you had about the same number of retirees and actives um, and that's shown on the top left pie chart. And then if you look to the top right pie chart, you can see that today uh, the retirees make up about two thirds of your population with the actives only about uh, 20%. The TV, that is a term for your inactive members who are uh, not working anymore, but they're not yet receiving benefit payments, but they are entitled to a benefit once they reach retirement age. And you can see then the shift to of the plan liabilities. Um, now the plan in 2022, the retiree liability makes up 70% of your liabilities. Finally, we get to the projections. Um, this slide is showing the projection of your uh, contributions. Last year, uh, the contribution was 17.9 million. And this valuation, it's 18.9 million, that $1 million increase. And you can see over the next four years that that contribution is expected to continue to increase. And that is due to phasing in this year's uh, loss on the value of assets. And so it's going to increase up to $20.6 million in 2028. Now, again, these projections, I wanna clarify that in these projections, we're assuming that the size of the tank is gonna remain exactly as we expected. All our actual assumptions are going to be met and the valve of that investment flow is going to continue to earn 6% each and every year. So this is assuming all actual assumptions are met. Then after the 2029 and 2028, when the contributions are around 20.5 20 million, you can see a gradual decrease in those contribution rates over time as fewer uh, active members are uh, accruing benefits and the number of your uh, membership declines. And then in 2038, that's where your last UAL payment is. And then it drops, you can see from 13.1 million down to 1 million. Um, and that then this is the 1 million represents just the cost of the active members who still have benefits accruing. And finally, we have a projection of the funded ratio, um, which you can see at the top are the funded ratios, 58% this year is gonna slowly increase over time. And there's a little bit of a drag on your funding progress because of those deferred asset losses. And then the funding policy is working, it increases over time to uh, actually 2037 when you're expected to be fully funded at 100%. Um, and so again, this projection is just showing that you're gonna keep making contribution to this plan until it's fully funded. And if all assumptions are met, that should happen in 2037 or 2038. Yeah, before I get to the board recommendation, those last two slides were, were really set in place about a decade ago. It gave, gave us an opportunity to become fully funded. You saw that 100% uh, funded uh, system, and it also included an opportunity for us to pay off that unfunded actuarial liability and get us to just a normal cost going forward. So with that, the board recommendation is that the MTS Executive Committee forward a recommendation to the MTS Board of Directors to receive the, actuar the Employee Retirement Plan actuarial valuation as of July 1st, 2021, and adopt the pension contribution amount of 18 million $946,198 for fiscal year 2024. And with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on the side? We do not. All right, go to uh, Member Moreno and our newest member of the executive committee who we welcome every time we meet. Thank you so much. This is Michelle, everybody. Our, um, my mom watches her and it's her birthday. So I had to bring her to work this spring. Bring your babe, bring your five month old to work today. Um, <laughs> Well, first and foremost, thank you for the presentation. And um, I always appreciate reading the Chiron 
actuarial reports. Uh, so thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I am supportive of the proposed action today, but I, I would like to take a moment uh, to make two very large points about our pension system. Uh, first, as a presentation noted, our current assumed rate of investment return is uh, 6%. Uh, in item four, we heard that our investment return last year was a negative 10.8%. Um, and in light of this, I think it, it's clear that the decision to gradually lower our assumed rate of return from 7.5 in 2015 to 6% in 2021 was a very prudent move. Um, it wasn't um, very popular <laughs> when I made that motion, but I, I, th I think it's, it was extremely prudent. Uh, so I strongly support reducing our assumed rate of return, uh, particularly in, in good investment years when the hit to our budget will be softened by positive returns. Um, and there is evidence that we should lower this assumed rate of return even further. Nathan, can I ask you to hold her sorry. while I'm making you offered, sorry? You offered. You offered so <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's okay. <laughs> um, so um, our average return over the last three years was 2.8%. And it was 4% over the last five years and 5% over the last 10 years. Um, all of these are lower than our current assumed rate of return of 6%. And some might conclude that further reductions are necessary because our average investment return since our pl uh, uh, plan in inception in 1982 was 8.5, but I respectfully disagree. Um, I believe the next 10 years will be more similar uh, to the last uh, five to 10 years than they uh, than, uh, they will be to the 1980s, uh, which means we should uh, look to reduce our assumed rate of return, uh, in my opinion, to between four um, and 5% at some point in the future. Uh, in order to lessen the blow to our annual budget, I believe this change should be phased over time. Uh, moving quickly in years with good investment returns and slowly on not, um, or maybe not at all, in years with uh, low or negative returns. Um, the second point I want to make, and it's something that I've brought up to this, not to this particular body, but to the board. Um, I'd, I, I, I'd like to ask um, to make it, uh, to, to ask staff to start anticipating what it might mean to open the system back up to existing and future bus drivers and other employees of San Diego Transit Corporation. Um, I, th I think uh, open up our pension system. Um, we did it in the city of San Diego. Um, we had to do it, right? Rightfully so. Um, so it's, it's nothing new in the region. Um, and I think this move is gonna help us recruit and retain employees. And it would also put MTS on par with all the other public employees in the region, um, all of which offer pensions, by the way. Uh, the city of San Diego, as I mentioned, suffered greatly by eliminating pensions in 2012. And we've been um, busy now for years trying to unwind that uh, mistake. So it's only a matter of time before MTS will have to restore pension benefits to San Diego Transit Corporation workers. And I just wanna make sure we're ready uh, when the day does come um, but back to the matter at hand uh, before us today, um, I will be uh, supporting staff's recommendation or moving the item, I should say. Um, and with, with that, that concludes my comments. Chair, thank you. Thank you. And I'm happy to, uh, to second that motion. And I also think it is appropriate to look at um, what it would take, what it would look like. I mean, pensions at their core are not ideological. It's money in. It's the slide we've heard showed. It's, it's an employee contribution, an employer contribution into a pot with a assumed rate of return and a knowledge of, of a actuarial assessment of what you're gonna to have to pay out. And so, you know, a lot of places when they immediately switch to a 401k, there's still an employee contribution, there's still an employer contribution. Um, and, you know, it puts the onus on the individual and great uncertainty for that one person based on when they retire and, and how the market's doing at that time. Um, but I think it could greatly help us and, and be of great assistance to, uh, to do that. And there's a way to do it in a, in a fiscally solvent way. We, we've all watched uh, as really bad decisions have been made to issue 13th checks when they're full or to give retroactive benefits without retroactive payments or a variety of other things that are not actuarially sound. And, uh, and I think there is a way to run a pension system uh, that protects the fiscal health of the agency and those as workers. So I would, I would join you in saying it's, we should explore what that would look like and, and how, how we would do that as we move forward. So I'm happy with that. Uh, Member Bush, you can't have her back. You know. <laughs> 
Thank you, Chair. Um, and I really, <clears throat> excuse me, I really appreciate staff and the consultants for uh, putting this uh, presentation together. I got to say, I was really impressed by the visual. Um, uh, to be honest, these uh, a lot of the pension system and retirement is complex, um, and all the investments, and everything that goes into it, and so that really helped to uh, uh, really put everything together. I'm a visual person, so I, I think that was one of the best um, out of all the different presentations I've seen um, when it comes to these retirement updates. That's that was really helpful. So, thank really, you. yeah. So no, thank you all. So appreciate that. That model needs to be replicated. Um, my question was, um, and, and I want to thank um, Councilmember Moreno, because I do remember, I was a staffer at the point, but I do remember you bringing that up um, at the time about the, um, you know, uh, adjusting our, um, our expected rate of return, I think it was. And so um, I do appreciate that. And I wanted to get, um, I was curious about that um, from staff. So I think at the time it was we were assuming, or we want to assume 6.5%, I think, or 7.5. Um, and then I think uh, Council Member Moreno um, led that effort to uh, reduce it to uh, 6.5. So if staff could comment more on that, just for my understanding, um, for that period. So if we left it at the 7.5, what would have been the, the impact to today? Yeah, if we go back a few couple slides. It was actually we were at six point seven five, and the and the direction from Councilmember Moreno was to bring it from six point seven five to six percent. And you can see um, in twenty twenty one, it's kind of hard to read, but on that bar, you can see what the contribution differential would be. Let's go back one more slide. Sorry. Um, yeah, just I I struggled. I, I'm like struggling with trying to understand what yeah. that what that would have been. What would the right. effect so, have been? You know. Yeah, back in in twenty thirteen when we had a seven and a half percent discount rate or discount that, rate. that, that blue the, the dark blue bar on this chart represents what the contributions would have been over the last 10 years so in 2022 you're looking at about 14 million versus the 18.9 million that we're talking about there if you can see on that the, the dark blue bar section of that last bar and okay so each time we reduce the discount rate um, there is an incremental increase in contributions so the, the 75 basis point reduction in 2022 represents probably about a million dollars. Right, but there's two. there were two things going on at the time there. Um, there was that reduction which increased your contribution, but the mortality assumption update. Our reduction, so when we changed it from 7.5 to 6.5, that's what you're talking about, right? When we reduced it from 6.75 to 6%, oh, the, so, the, last, yeah. the last two years. Got yeah. It. So if you look at in the last two years on the slide there, that blue, that light blue uh, bar represents the net impact of the reduction in the discount rate and the mortality update assumption, which actually decreased your liabilities because it was an adjustment from the mortality assumption that we did six years ago. We were a little bit too optimistic uh, back in 2016 as actuaries, uh, thinking that people were going to live much longer than they were going to when their improvement in mortality was going to increase. So back in 2021, that got adjusted. So that was actually a decrease. So it's it's kind of both of those impacts are shown in this uh, slide right here. So overall, is that a positive impact? That was that reduction was a positive impact to the the mortality. Yes, we 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 were still thinking people are going to well, live the mortality. Longer. The adjustment that we did. Yeah. So I, I would say that the adjustment down um, to the discount rate is more in line with what our investment returns have been, and and as Councilmember Moreno has has identified it, you know, over the last ten years, it's been around five percent. So in, the, in that year, when we had a 21% uh, return, it was prudent to make that discount rate adjustment down by 75 basis points. And in future years, as we continue to see years of positive performance, to further look on, on reducing that discount rate as well. So, And I, um, do, I do want to make a comment um, based on, um, you know, looking back all the way to the 80s when we were saying what the expected or what the actual rate of return was on investments the market environment was drastically different than it is now back then pension plans could earn their assumed rate of return by just investing in u.s treasuries right the rates back then were 10 percent 9 10 11 percent and so there was no risk involved in in the pension plans because you could earn all of what you needed to investing in bonds and treasuries now, however, that climate is very different, 
it has improved in terms of, you know, these interest rates have been rising, so we can get more return on safer investments, um, but it's still nowhere what it was like in the 80s. So it's a, it's a drastically, it's, it's not apples to apples by looking at a, you know, 40, 50 year landscape of actual returns. There's much more risk involved in, in getting those returns these days. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, I appreciate you all going into that. That helps me my understanding much better. So appreciate that. Thanks. The change in mortality might be positive for pension funds, probably not for society as a whole. They're still, <laughs> no one they're, was they're still that. thinking that we're going to have improvements. It's just not as many. It's not as yeah. much improvement as we well, anticipated. Yeah. Is lost a million people in a pandemic. Well, no, and that's that's pre-pandemic too. Right. That's not even. But in general, I mean, life expectancies in the U.S. are not going up, right? I don't believe. Um. Well, been trending down the last couple of years. There's so many different theories on that, yeah. right? With COVID, there's one theory is that people, um, you know, there's long COVID, it's still around, you know, that mortality is, you know, going to increase. Um, but then there's also the uh, opposite side of the argument where um, a lot of what's happened with COVID is a lot of the older, right. more um, vulnerable older people who are predisposed to other conditions have passed. And so thinking that now it's like a stronger, healthier population that's just, so then Remain, with that, yeah. Remaining. So, and who knows how that's all gonna play out. Yeah, I think that it's, it, no one knows, so. Good to uh, member Elo and then we'll come back to Vice Chair Whitmer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, the questions from my colleagues were great here. Um, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious though just to build off the question that Councilmember Moreno made and and Chair Fletcher uh, echoed. Thinking forward, what would be the considerations if we were to to start adding you know new workers into the the pension program again? In considerations in ter in terms of financial considerations. Yeah, well, I mean, what what would we expect? What would change? What would be the things for us to keep in mind? Yeah, it, it would be a significant increase in cost, a, a structural increase in cost year over year. And, and, it's, and it's not just the normal cost. We would have to do an actuarial review of this, but it, it would be several million dollars per year, uh, just in normal cost. And then you have to factor into consideration um, when, we, when we don't hit specific targets for our investment return, um, the risk is now on the agency, and so we would have a growing unfunded actuarial liability, which we would have to, as Ann had mentioned before, those are layered into the plan, and those will be additional contributions that MTS would pay each and every year. And I wanted to add to that. So the rationale as to why we got out of it was because it was such an unsustainable, um, it's a, a very small plan, and we don't get the investment returns that you can get in a large statewide plan or the county's plan, the city's plan. Um, so it it was becoming to a point where it was becoming such, it would become such a large percentage of our operating budget that it was just not sustainable over time. So the board would have to weigh the investment in reopening the plan with things like more service, lower fares, free fares for youth, you know, all of the big ticket items that we're talking about with operations, we would have to weigh that kind of a decision. It couldn't be made in a vacuum because it would be such an importantly large decision. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and the one thing what Larry mentioned, um, the normal cost, the cost of accruing benefits for the active members would increase obviously. And um, the unfunded, the current unfunded becomes more uh, volatile and, and, and um, more susceptible to uh, market changes, but one other big piece is since you haven't been paying any benefits for the people who are not in the plan, since it's a closed plan, you, there's been no normal cost over the years for any of these people. So you come, you'd also have to immediately incur a big hit to your unfunded liability based on all that past service that has not been funded for. Well, but that, that would be assuming that you were going to take someone who's been there 10 years and give them the equivalent of 10 years of pension benefits without making 10 years of contributions. Right. Right. I, I right. mean, that's, that's, so but, 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 I, but I don't, I don't think anyone would, would oh, suppose okay. that we would do that. Okay. I think yes. what the city went through, which our city council members are very familiar, is trying to unwind and unpack 
right. people contributed to something else. How do you convert that right. over? Right. Well, so, and that's what, yeah. And they, but that's it, what it, they it, did, it would yeah. not be wise to say, we're going to give you 10 years right. of credit when no one's made any payment and no Correct. one's going that's to make what I was oh, assuming that, Well, that, that, that wouldn't work. Yeah. That wouldn't be actuarially okay, sound. Right. Um, you know, I wouldn't think, but I think- But the, just the, going forward. Yeah, going forward. The, yeah. the other question would be, is, is there a way that perhaps we could participate um, and, you know, and maybe it's this one runs course and there's a new one created, but is there a way to partner with one of those larger pension systems to join in so that you're not having to run? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me, let, let me let you continue. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, Sean. I apologize. We were on the same. We were tracking. Yeah. That, I mean, that was, I mean, I'm curious about that because there's a, with us having a small fund, but that, could be different than participating in a larger fund. And I'm just kind of, because certainly there's got to be smaller agencies that make pensions work um, throughout the country. Um, and uh, so, I, I mean, like I said, I think it's, what I know, it raised the issue. I think there's interest here from an employee retention perspective. There's a values case for it. There's a, and wanting to understand the, the, you know, what we should be thinking about understood, Sharon, that there's, um there's things to weigh on that on, on that front right there's there's balances um but having an understanding of what considerations we should take into account but also what options might be there um, if we were to go that route i think is important for us the other thing i'll just add is we also i think should try and assess how valuable a tool this is in recruiting and retention because we continue to pay out more and more to augment contracts, to give raises, to do things to entice people to come into work. And, you know, perhaps you can make an investment, this thing that would help greatly with our recruitment and retention, uh, that if we don't do this, we're just going to continue to increase costs on the other side. Yeah, that, that is the last thing I was going to say is, you know, just seeing this on the, on the city side, the, the, the notion that there was savings is ludicrous because we're, we're contracting out such a significant portion of our work mm -hmm. without even getting the things done that we need to get done. MTS isn't in that situation, but this is a, obviously a highly competitive uh, market in terms of recruit, recruitment, retention. Uh, we struggled on our own um, right on that front. Um, and it, I think just like we have to weigh the pros and cons of what um, we may or may not be able to afford, there's externalities in terms of benefits as well uh, that I think we should take into account as well. Thank you, Chair. So last time mean, working at the county that we've spent um, the last 10 years in our recruiting efforts pointing out to applicants that if they go to work at the city, they don't get a pension. They, <laughs> they want to be a park ranger. And we say, well, you can go there, but you're not going to get a pension. You come to us, you're going to get a pension. Um, and uh, and it certainly has given us an advantage. So perhaps, perhaps it won't last moving forward, but it's helped us last 10 years. So Well, I would uh, say, for instance, for CalPERS, we pay what each employee pays 8% of their salary. Is it? Point eight percent yet? Some yeah, I think it's in that neighborhood. Um, and so that's you have to weigh that as well because the employees don't necessarily want to pay eight percent of their salary into a pension plan. Yeah, right now I believe employees pay under the defined contribution plan they pay two percent and we match that and add six percent to their defined contribution plan. So we're putting in eight percent plus their two percent. That's great until they're. A senior, and they probably wish they, they might have, but it's worth looking at. Uh, Vice Chair Whitburn. Not to pile on, but I too would be interested in uh, assessing uh, the potential here, um, understanding how our current retirement plan impacts uh, the agency's competitiveness, if at all. Um, it'd be important to understand what the employee groups might think of uh, some sort of a conversion. Um, and then obviously the financial component, uh, certainly, you know, um, a couple of our groups are in CalPERS. And so what would be the, the, the potential for having new employees in this one into CalPERS? Um, the other question that I had was around the um, confidence level in the assumptions going forward uh, to get our uh, 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 pension as it's currently constructed, fully funded. I noticed that over the past 10 years, the funded ratio has actually declined. 
uh, we're projecting here that over the next 13 years, the funded ratio is going to increase to 100%. How confident are we are in the assumptions that would get us there? Um, I, I can start and Anne can, can jump in. Um, you know, when, when, you, when you take a targeted discount rate and you continue to lower it, it has the effect of reducing your funded lack, um, liability. Uh, because as Ann mentioned, that pot gets bigger and your investments don't change. So the unfunded portion of it increases. So that reduces your percentage funded. Um, over, will, if we're looking at this slide, will the, will it look exactly how it's, the funded ratio is gonna be projected going forward? Now we'll have some ups and downs, um, but with the, the, the plan that, how it stands and how we are paying off that unfunded, actuarial liability over time, we will get to 2038 to get to 100% fully funded just by the structure of how it's, how we structured that 25 year projection, if, if you will. Right, so this year, any actuarial loss, which was a loss, loss or gain, but it was a loss this year, gets amortized over 15 years to hit that target date, right? And amortized meaning it's equal payments over the next 15 years, like a mortgage. Next year, whatever gain or loss we have will be amortized over 14 years and so on and so on. So what's going to happen the way the current policy is structured is, you know, five years out, any changes in that unfunded will be amortized over five years. So your contribution rate will become more volatile as a result of that. But it will ensure if that contribution is paid that you will get to that 100% funded because we're not extending it out over the course after 2038. Understood. So regardless of the accuracy of the assumptions, we're just going to do whatever it takes in terms of employer contributions to make sure we get there. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Get that That's a very in. succinct way of saying that. Yes. <laughs> that the challenges uh, uncertainty of closing the system. In terms of uh, what's that? The, well, it's just the there's uncertainty, but there's a definite certainty of right. closing a plan. Yes. In terms of and closing uh, your amortization period. That's to, right. To be yes. That's right. All right, Member Bush, and then we're going to move on. Yeah. Sorry. Follow up question from uh, the chair's um, comments about uh, COVID. So, did the COVID uh, mortality rate did that decrease the unfunded or unfunded liability? Um. So over the last two years, and this I've seen this in almost all of the California pension plans is that um, the people, like I said, who tended to pass were the ones who were older um, and didn't have, you know, their life expectancy was already uh, not as long as someone who's, let's say, 55. And so what ended up happening is the number of people who may have passed was more than expected, but on a benefit basis, the benefits that are no longer being paid were actually less than expected. So it really didn't have much of a liability impact on the plan. Got it. So, Thank you. yeah. Member Moreno. Sorry, I just wanna point out, um, we do have um, MTS employees who ha are in the pension, right? Yes. Yes, and those employees are, are white collared management workers. Um, well, all. It's anybody um, that was pre predated the closure of the pension plan. So it was negotiated with the union to close the plan and move to, and then they obviously got benefits at the same time because of that. Um, and so, anybody after that was not allowed to be in the plan, but there are still drivers that yeah, are there are driving. 330 40. active members in the pension plan. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. One thing that was pointed out um, for us to move forward in regards to opening up our pension system is to have an actuarial report. Um, so I'm the chair of the budget, but in the motion, I want to uh, modify the motion to direct uh, the budget committee to look into um, an actuary, what an actuarial plan for opening up our pension systems. Just start that uh, ball rolling. Yep, happy to add that in. Thank you. All right, we have a motion by Member Moreno, seconded by myself, to adopt the recommendations, direct the budget committee to 
uh, explore these uh, preliminary and initial phases. Uh, with that, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? And Larry, thank you. We're going to move to item six, uh, security services contract amendment. It's an action item for the board to consider. We'll turn it over to Al for the presentation. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Executive Committee. I'm Al Styler. I'm the Director of Transit Security and Passenger Safety here at MTS. My presentation this morning will be in regards to a uh, proposal for a contract amendment with Intercon Security. Just uh, some brief background uh, on the contract. Uh, we entered into the contract with Intercon Security on July 29th of 2021. That was after an almost 30 year uh, uh, contract with uh, Allied Universal in some form or another to do our contract security services here. Uh, the contract gave into con security uh, provision of security service to route our MTS system, and the contract was for three years with an optional two years uh, to run through 2026. The amount of the contract at the time it was signed was just uh, above $66 million. Uh, right now, uh, the contract calls for approximately 190 contractor personnel. That's a mix of armed and unarmed officers with uh, supervisors, dispatchers, and administrative personnel. We had three amendments to the contract since it was signed. Uh, one was to approve on-the-job billable training that allowed Intercon Security to uh, increase their hourly wages uh, to, the, to the guards, and uh, other was for additional insurance and update on uh, vehicles. The contract totaled uh, with the updates was $66,170,000. A little more on background. Uh, if you see, you see in this chart here in 2022, we had almost 100% turnover in staff. And uh, part of the reason for that was when Allied left, they did a, a big job of recruiting all the incumbents and, and took them with them uh, uh, to other uh, sites and other areas. Uh, in the first six months of the year, what we were trying to get uh, ourselves situated, our turnover was about 10.7% a month. But you can see in the last six months of the year, we've gotten that down to just under 6% a month. Uh, Intercon also has what they call a health report. At the end of every shift, officers are allowed to, uh, on their app, when they're closing up their shift, they just signify, was it a good shift, bad shift? You know, what was the reason for that? And in the first six months of the year, uh, we had only 72% of the staff were happy with their shift and 10% felt they had a bad shift. Uh, we've turned that around to now over 80% of the staff are happy with their shift and only 5.2% feel that they've had a bad shift. That's important because, you know, we want a happy, uh, steady uh, security services out there. You know, uh, it helps us with our training. It helps us with our, our, uh, our policies. It just helps us to provide a better uh, product for our customers. The reason that we uh, request in this contract amendment is for a few reasons, but first of all, as we all know, the cost of living increases for the past year has significantly affected us here in San Diego and throughout the nation. Uh, there's also been a big challenge in hiring everybody, just about in everybody field, but particularly in security services and for frontline employees. It's also a big competition for labor, labor and the higher cost of living here in San Diego. Uh, uh, Intercon also has contracts in San Diego with Amazon and with the Downtown Partnership, and they're paying their uh, guards $20 an hour uh, for doing what I consider to be a little bit easier work than what, what our team has been asked to do. So these are the proposed changes. The most significant are for our armed and unarmed officers. Um, armed officers will go up about $1.41 to $22 an hour in 2023. Unarmed officers will go from what was originally 16, almost 16 and a half per hour up to $20 an hour, which is a, almost uh, just above a three and a half dollar an hour change. Also making significant changes in our dispatch area. Uh, dispatch is the eyes and ears and really the nerve center of our team and, and having a steady uh, um, component of personnel up there is critical to us being able to dispatch to our officers and to assist our public. The contract proposal uh, amendment also uh, includes wage increases for the following three years of the contract of 4%, 4%, and 3%. Uh, 
Uh, this is a, a brief cost analysis. Um, for the first three years, the base period of the contract, the change will be uh, $2,061,000. And if we include the optional two years at the end, it'll be $5.2 million uh, increase in the contract. To put this into context, and I'm sure everyone remembers that in uh, April of last year, MTS conducted a customer satisfaction survey. The last question of the survey asked our, our riders what they thought would be uh, most beneficial to improve their riding experience. And uh, about half of the respondents replied that uh, more security would improve their transit experience. Now, what that means to an individual is, is different. You know, what most, more security means to me could be different to somebody else. And uh, as some of our advisory groups uh, recommended, we're going to have passenger focus groups that dig a little bit deeper on what that actually means. So on February 22nd and 23rd of this month, we'll be conducting those focus groups just to little, dive a little deeper and to find out more about what exactly people expect from us and our security department, what their expectations are, and what do they know about us, what we're really our abilities are. So this will give us a chance to reimagine what our security department is, what we do, and what we will be going forward. Just some of those options, just you know, uh, putting things out there. Does that mean increasing our code compliance staffing? Uh, they have a little bit more authority than our security team because they can enforce our rules and regulations as approved by the board. Does it mean inc increasing our contract security supplement or just modifying the mix in the personnel between unarmed and armed? And also, uh, does it include uh, going to a law enforcement component? Uh, do we contract out with another uh, agency to provide law enforcement services or do we look to start an in-house uh, department? You know, we've basically been using the same model of security and passenger safety here since the road started. And it's a lot different world than it was. Then. So with that, uh, our recommendation will be that the executive committee uh, forward to the board of directors uh, and authorize the CEO to execute MTS document G2359.5-20 uh, with Intercon Security Services in the amount of $5,273,494 intercon contracted security uh, employee, employee wage increases for the provision of security services through December 31st, 2026. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Do we have any public uh, speakers? We do not. Um, can I just add one more thing? Typically, in a normal time of year, we would have brought this to the Public Security Committee. It is more budgetary, though, um, but we're in a situation where we really need to assist in getting um, new hires into security at this point. And so we felt if we brought it to the executive committee and then bring it to the board, if you have any objections about that, the problem is, is that um, we're going to stretch out the pain of not being able to get hires into the positions. Um, so that's just so unclear. We're not adding any new positions. We're not increasing anything. We're just, we're just making this change to be able to fill the this existing is, positions. Yes, okay. we're not adding any positions right now. Uh, it's not a policy change. It's a budget change to okay. be able to meet the staffing we've already approved. A, a lot has changed in the year and a half since we signed this contract. And, you know, uh, between retaining staff and the competition and the prices that are just going up for hiring security has, has really made it, it will make it impossible for us to keep the team that we have now uh, and they can go other places and get better pay. Got it. Member Ela. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I, um, one, the 97% turnover rate, I, I will say, I, I know that there were challenges last year, but seeing that number, if I would imagine if you asked us, you're gonna see a 97% turnover rate. Um, we would all expect there to be massive, massive, impacts on operations. Um, and so I think it's a testament to you and staff to uh, that there wasn't, um, you know, obviously there was some impact, but to not have had the whole thing kind of um, feel like chaos, um, just from an operational standpoint, I think is just a sign of really good leadership. So I just wanna applaud you for that. Thank you. Um, that's a, it's a lot of people to turn over um, in a relatively short amount of time. So I wanna say thank you for that. I also wanna uh, say that I appreciate your acknowledgement of the difference, the the universal need for security, but the the very nuanced and personalized um, um, element of what makes us feel secure or safe. Uh, I I just really appreciate that, and it's um, that is a fundamental belief of of me and, and my team, 
and how we approach safety is and, and taking the time to ask our riders what would you know everyone says they want to feel secure and having the the, the, the actual conversation about what that would mean I think is going to be really impactful so uh, that's that's separate with respect to the the increases here it makes sense um, one thing that we always um, want to make sure we fully understand in layman's terms is why um, certain positions are prioritized over others in terms of, of who would be receiving uh, the additional comp compensation and how much more they'll be receiving. Um, so if you can just kind of lay that in, out in the simplest terms possible. Sure. Well, that, for me, it's always gonna be as simple as terms when it comes to the financial stuff, but you know, all, unarmed guards are just just too low to, to be paid. You know, with the, the, the minimum wage went up, cost of living is, is, is so sky high right now. That to, to bring them up to that twenty dollar level will just make it uh, compatible and, and uh, competitive with other markets. Uh, unarmed, we were already pretty much in, and the armed uh, officers we were already in that target area, so there was no need for that need for that bigger increase. Uh, the, uh, with our uh, dispatch staff, we were having a, a significant turnover. It, that very stressful situation being in the dispatch control center. Calls coming in emergencies, calls, uh, and we were losing uh, talented people just. Uh, the, it was easier to go to another agency to dispatch uh, than to stay here. So increasing them to a competitive rate will help us maintain a steady workforce there. Got it. And, and the last question, do we have any sense of, of what sort of um, kind of the, the, any sort of equity considerations, the demographics of, of kind of what, um, who would be most benefited by the increases that are being provided? Uh, I don't have, you know, demographics on it. I just, we have 190 uh, contract security personnel and just about everyone's going to be benefiting from this increase. Okay. Got it. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. If you're looking for a motion, happy to make it. Thank you. Happy to second. Member Hall? Yeah, I just, could you elaborate a little bit on the health report again? Is that? Yeah, so this is, this is great. And we're trying to actually get this from, we're developing an app for our team. Uh, yeah. But the health report is at the end of every shift when they're logging off on their cell phones and mobile devices, it comes up. The last thing is, you know, how was your shift? You know, was it good, mm -hmm. indifferent, or was it bad? And what were the reasons for it? And it gives manager, the personal reason, other, and, and teammates. And they get to report on that every, at the end of every shift. So well, that's security in there? I mean, is security? That's the security team. Okay. That's our contract no, security I, I, team. Well, let me rephrase that. Um, is it? Yeah, because I had to, you know, wrestle this guy down, or is it because I was being harassed by somebody I was trying to, you know, code enforcement or something? We, we don't break it down into okay. individuals. If, if somebody reports a, a bad shift a few days in a row, we'll, we'll speak with them and say, hey, what happened? You know, is there something significant going on? But the, the purpose for that slide was to show when we, we've got a, a, a steady, a steadier workforce mm -hmm. now and a more satisfied workforce. And when people are going out into the field and they're happy about their job and comfortable in their job, they'll tend to do a better job. Well, I, I guess the logic I'm using is you have somebody having a bad shift, which line are they on? Are they on the green line, they're on the blue line, they're on the orange line? We haven't broken it down, down by, down by and what that's line. That's the only reason I'm saying is because now we can kind of narrow it down to where, why they're having a bad mm -hmm. shift, what's going on. And, uh, and at that point, you know, depending on the lines, you know, you're going to need more security. Mm -hmm. When people talk about the orange line that you're going to, honestly, we need more security on the orange line. Yeah, so. All right. We have a motion by member Elo Rivera, seconded by myself. Al, we appreciate all the work you're doing. We brought you in at a difficult time. Uh, you came in, we were going through quite a bit. And I have had to uh, contend with a lot and a lot of changes. So we appreciate the work you're doing. And that we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. We're going to go to item seven, Spring Street Station Transit Oriented Development. Uh, this was a uh, action item for the board. We'll turn it over for presentation. And for any of you who don't know, Sean Myatt um, joined us a year ago as our yep. head of um, land management, real estate. Um, been a great addition to our staff. And I'll just follow that. You know, Sean and I have been working really closely on all of our TOD projects. And now that he's a year in and has kind of been the lead on some of these projects, we're kind of turning a lot of these presentations over um, to him to introduce them. I will clarify this is an action item for the executive committee. You know, under our board policy 18, um, approving us entering into 
negotiations after an unsolicited offer, the executive committee can authorize the CEO to do that. And then the final deal would come back to the board. But so today you will either give us direction to go forward or, um, or not, but it, it wouldn't go to the board next week. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for your time. I'm Sean, and uh, we'll get started here talking about Spring Street. So a lot of things happened between 2020 and uh, 2022. The city of La Mesa started and completed their transit-oriented development uh, feasibility study. The MTS board uh, complied with the Surplus Land Act and the notification requirements. And during that notification, we did not receive a notice of interest. And then in late uh, 2021, uh, per board policy uh, 18, MTS is allowed to receive unsolicited proposals, and we received one from Affirmed Housing. Since the Transit or uh, La Mesa study was not completed yet, uh, we wanted to see the results of that. And in the meantime, uh, we considered the results of the, uh, the study. And then late last year, <clears throat> we noticed, as per board policy 18, uh, receipt of an unsolicited proposal and with 30 day window for uh, anybody uh, to submit a competing proposal. And in that time frame, we received a proposal from Chelsea uh, Investment Corporation and USA Property Stock. Uh, so the station is currently, you know, it's Spring Street out in La Mesa. It's served by the Orange Line and bus lines, currently bus lines 850 and 8. Thank you. 851 and 855. Uh, right now there are uh, close to 300 parking um, uh, spots at the station, but for approximately the last 10 years or so, the 115 have been kind of cordoned off to uh, help out with reducing costs for capital improvement projects. Essentially, uh, this is one of the areas where we, at the moment, are overparked. So going forward, right now, uh, as we see in the uh, next slides, we'll be basing all of the uh, statistics and analysis on the currently the 180 spaces that are currently used for transit. So also to point out at this station, the only facilities out there as far as restrooms are a uh, portable restroom that is designated specifically for uh, MTS bus drivers. And on the restroom note, uh, we, in response to some of the comments that we've heard from the board and from the general public, uh, MTS staff proactively reached out to all three development teams and asked them two questions. One, uh, we see that you've, you know, created three great submittals, but can you add into these uh, programs, uh, the construction of uh, public restroom facilities, and also for our uh, MTS bus driver staff. And not only that, can you build them, but also can you incorporate them into your long range maintenance uh, and security plans since they will be on site for the duration and they will continue to provide services for the uh, communities that they're creating. And we wanted to uh, ask our development partners if they could take on those costs and incorporate them into their long range operations, security and maintenance plans. So with that, we'll go through the slides. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, there's just to keep in mind, there's the comparison slide. So we'll look at all three of these at the end. So I'm not going to go too far down into the numbers here, but here you have the affirm site. Uh, they have, uh, created two buildings, uh, with about 152 units and 123,000 square feet of, uh, affordable, uh, using, uh, living space. And once again, all three of these were 100% uh, affordable. They have a nice blend of studio to three bedrooms. Uh, they, uh, by focusing on two and three bedrooms, they've maximized uh, bedroom counts. And important to remember here is, you know, we're transit first as a board policy is. So we want to make sure that whatever we're doing on these sites, we're not adversely impacting our transit. And so that's what the dotted lines here kind of show the bus, the current bus, uh, or excuse me, the proposed bus uh, routing. Um, as we've heard from uh, multiple surveys, you know, one of the reasons people don't take transit is that it takes you know, longer. So we wanted to be uh, cautious of adding additional bus time here. So in the affirm proposal, uh, the firm proposal keeps the existing bus routing. And in response to staff's questions, affirm not only uh, committed or, or uh, committed to uh, constructing, but also maintaining uh, any restrooms and or MTS bus driver break room facilities that may or may not be needed depending upon uh, how the bus uh, operations side works. Um, they did not, the, uh, affirmed replacement parking was, uh, about 36% and looking at, uh, their, uh, 
kind of rough draft of their pro forma, we staff didn't identify any major red flags. Uh, moving to the Chelsea proposal. Could you explain the commercial and community? Yeah, the commercial and community spaces. Uh, so right now these are kind of, uh, you know, they're just, uh, these proposals are uh, kind of uh, a, a moving target and they will adjust based on as market factors adjust, but uh, their commercial spaces at the affirm site here is on the um, north side towards the driveway on Spring Street. And if I recall, they're looking at approximately 1,000 to 15,000 square feet of, of uh, kind of commercial space. Um, and that is in addition to the community space that is also integrated uh, within the platform designs. What he's trying to say is that's on the ne negotiable during the negotiation process and those are really just placeholders to say what could be there and uh, right uh, so moving to Chelsea once again 100% affordable um, but as you can see Chelsea only uh, built on the north uh, side of the site left the entire site uh, quite wide open uh, they also, due to the building footprint, increased the bus travel time uh, by adding uh, more, just physically more uh, feet to the actual bus driver's path of travel. Um, and because they had a smaller building footprint, they had a little less square footage and units as well as bedrooms, uh, bedroom count. Uh, but Chelsea did commit to construction and long-term maintenance of uh, public restroom facilities and also uh, as needed uh, bus driver uh, facilities. Uh, we're looking at their replacement parking. It was significantly higher because Chelsea, you know, didn't really maximize the site. They left that whole uh, southern end completely open. And then as looking at the, again, once again, they're back of the envelope pro forma. They didn't, uh, MTS staff did not identify any uh, significant red flags. Uh, moving to the USA site, uh, this is definitely the maximalist uh, proposal. They've proposed a parking structure wrapped with uh, housing as well as an additional standalone uh, uh, housing only structure. So that's why you get the significant 173 units and but a little less than the affirmed proposal on the actual square footage. And that's because of the mix of the unit types, as you can see USA uh, believed that the market was best served by having a larger uh, single bedroom uh, units as opposed to larger, uh, more family oriented units. And that's reflected in their bedroom count, which is higher than Chelsea, but then less than affirmed. Uh, this also then did increase uh, the bus travel time. Um, and USA, when it came to uh, construction of uh, restroom facilities, for brake drivers and or the public, they committed to trying to work diligently to integrate it into their proposal, but they were a little hesitant to commit to long-term maintenance. Um, obviously, they you know, replaced a significant amount of parking because of the parking structure for MTS transit passengers. And this is this now we're only kind of analyzing MTS transit passenger parking. We haven't, uh, we're not talking about the actual uh, folks who live on site. Um, but when we, uh, asked this, asked the USA of uh, their, you know, kind of their financial stack, they relied a lot upon uh, the affordable housing and the sustainable communities uh, grant program. And while USA has been successful in other parts of the state in getting those uh, funds, and we appreciate their optimism, staff was a little concerned that this could present a risk to this uh, building getting built because we have observed um, that uh, the region in general, and uh, specifically on some MTS projects in the past, we haven't had a whole lot of success. And USA was basing a large part of their financial uh, pro forma on receiving this. So we thought that was a risk that we wanted to flag here. And like I said, here's the side-by-side -side comparison. So you can see that affirmed, you know, the headline number will always be unit counts, right? But when you dive deep into it, you've got square footage, you've got bedrooms, and then of course you have the mix of units. So uh, USA beats uh, everybody on the headline number, but when you get down into you know, square footage, you, Affirmed has a stronger square footage as well as bedrooms, which speaks to their uh, more uh, larger units and uh, more family kind of uh, focused um, development. Um, 
Yeah, and then you can go to the bus travel uh, change or increases. A firm did not change the bus travel, and uh, they also did commit to maintenance and uh, construction of public restroom facilities. So uh, based on all of these factors, MTS staff is recommending that, you know, we move forward into an exclusive negotiation agreement with affirmed housing. Uh, we want to recognize USA and Chelsea and say that they did uh, put forth very uh, competitive and viable uh, uh, presentation and uh, proposal. And we know that, uh, you know, as we have worked with, you know, as, as we've worked with these entities in the past, we know that we can work with them to, if we were to choose them, we could uh, probably come up with a very viable spot for Spring Street. So we wanted to acknowledge that they did do a very good job and it was close, but we thought the affirmed uh, proposal was the best starting point for an exclusive negotiation agreement. You know, these are not full RFQ, RFP uh, processes were mostly uh, receiving unsolicited proposals. And so we're trying to pick the best starting point from which MTS staff can then go ahead and negotiate uh, different things, whether it be restrooms, unit count changes and things like that. Um, so then I'll just pick up just a, a couple of other things. And yeah, that's, you know, the board put forward and approved, um, and we're not statutorily required to do anything else to allow us to do unsolicited offers. So that's once we've complied with AB 1486 and the Surplus Land Act, and we're out of that, which this property has been cleared, then we're allowed to go back to our original process. And for these, especially fairly small projects, you know, small things, you know, our understanding of your policy preferences, we want to be as efficient and effective as possible. And so, you know, if you've got three proposals, um, it seems that we're supposed to narrow down to and give the board a recommendation of who should we do that next level of, of negotiations with. If we do additional negotiations with each of these parties, we will just get proposals that are closer and closer together and harder to choose from. And so that seems to string along developers longer than necessary. They have to invest more time and it just extends the process. And so to the extent we're trying to be as fast as possible, by, but still meet our needs. You know, that's how we've interpreted the board's direction on how to evaluate these um, unsolicited proposals. And so the proposal today is to go forward with a firm. Um, I will, you know, and, and this is just the first step, and then we would dive deeper into what their proposal is. Um, we did give a briefing, and I've had further conversations with Council Member Dillard from La Mesa. Um, she did, you know, indicate that she is supportive of this um, as the choice to move forward with. Um, she has a few issues that she wants to kind of further understand, you know, and we committed to keeping her involved in the process throughout the negotiations to get her consultation. Um, so that will happen as well. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any public speakers in the side? We do. Uh, Karina Contreras, please unmute yourself. Though. Thank you so much. My name is Karina Contreras, and uh, I'm the transportation policy advocate for Climate Action Campaign. Uh, I really appreciate the presentation going through uh, the different proposals. Uh, they all had really good points, but I think uh, I, I really do uh, applaud a firm's uh, proposal. The bedroom count, looking at, you know, I know it could fluctuate, but uh, having a mixture of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, especially the two and three bedrooms are incredibly important uh, for folks that have a family that want to stay together, whether it's, uh, you know, a nuclear family or a multi-generational family that wants to stay together. Uh, I appreciate the commitment to uh, the construction and long-term maintenance of public and bus driver restroom facilities. Uh, that's incredibly important for not only the public, but uh, our bus operators who really are the backbone of this whole system. Uh, they need to be able to access a restroom uh, quickly and safely. Um, some of the needs uh, for this proposal, you know, I, I would love to see um, uh, more ATP weaved into the design to connect folks to the bus uh, in a better way. Uh, bike parking, protected bike lanes, uh, trees, shading, um, the bike lanes, uh, making sure that sidewalks are built uh, where, where they are appropriate. Um, but overall, uh, you know, I think Affirmed really has brought a, a competitive proposal for this site. Uh, so I appreciate uh, all the um, uh, 
the dedication that went into looking at these uh, different aspects that the public has been asking for. Uh, so with that, uh, just thank you for the opportunity to speak on this. That concludes public comment, Chair. Thank you. Go to uh, Vice Chair Whitburn and then Member Elo Rivera. Thank you, Chair. I am curious uh, as to whether or to what degree the three developers had opportunities to modify their initial proposals, uh, whether these, what we're evaluating are essentially their initial proposals or uh, are they closer to their best offers? And, uh, you know, I appreciate your point, Ms. Landers, that, um, you know, if you get into a back and forth, it could take more time uh, and the proposals get closer together. I think in some instances they could all get better. And so I just wanted to uh, get a sense as to uh, what kind of conversations happened between the three and what opportunities they had to improve their proposals. So, uh, yes, it was, uh, it's not, this board policy 18 is not a, a full blown RFQ, RFP uh, process. So the initial proposal came in from a firm and then we saw within 30 days, uh, Chelsea and USA submit proposals. Uh, staff did reach out with a variety of questions, the restroom questions, uh, a couple of operational questions. There's a stairway uh, from a spring creek. Can you make sure you incorporate that? So, and then there was a financial question as well, um, but that really didn't uh, give uh, any of the three, you know, we didn't ask say, hey, we have these comments. Can you please, you know, send us your best and final. So <laughs> the board policy 18, the way it's structured right now, it's, there's not, um, we're not doing that at the moment, but and but the way we're kind of working that in is once we get to the exclusive negotiation uh, agreement phase, uh, we take comments from uh, the board, the public, uh, the local council uh, persons, and we that's where we really get a chance to kind of work uh, and make sure we get the best, uh, greatest proposal for MTS, for the community. Um, and so that's where the real opportunity to uh, modify based on market factors, uh, community outreach needs and things like that really come in. So at, at the moment, the short answer is, is no, there hasn't been a whole lot of back and forth. Thank you. Member Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I think this is some really good stuff in front of us. I appreciate the explanation on the process. Um, that is, is helpful for us uh, or, or for me at least. Um, Definitely uh, appreciate the request for the development to to include uh, the restrooms with maintenance. Um, obviously, the, the maintenance piece of this is, is critical um, and hope that we can continue uh, to lay that expectation for future transit oriented de uh, develop developments on MTS property. Um, I'm also curious where the um, about the upcoming parking study and and want to say that I, I will be reluctant to to see any decrease in the number of, of homes that um, that are currently being proposed um, if I, I, I'd hate to see a trade-off for parking instead of homes um, so I just want to put that out there now um, the last thing that I wanted to mention and we heard this actually in public comment was um, any opportunities to uh, to encourage a firm to 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 develop this in such a way that is really amenable to first mile, last mile options. So uh, connections um, with bikes, um, with shuttles, other things of that nature um, that can really help encourage those folks who live in the surrounding area to access the transit that is there more easily would be great. As I understand it, this is not uh, currently an uh, especially walk or bike friendly area. Um, and so any ways that they can help uh, shape that um, in, in such a way that um, you know, makes it easier and safer and more likely for folks to walk or bike to, to the transit station um, who are living nearby, but not currently doing that, um, that would be great. Uh, the last thing I will, I will say, and I, I say this pretty much anytime something like this comes forward is to me, the proposal in front of us is, is, should serve as a baseline. Um, I think that these processes, um, if we don't take that position, uh, are ripe for, for, for gaming by um, developers as they make the proposals. Um, that is certainly the case when it comes to the restrooms and the maintenance aspect. Um, I use the, the, the term um, for a, a uh, surplus land act uh, decision that came to, 
the city council uh, that I don't want to set a precedent for allowing the best liars to win. Um, and I certainly don't want MTS to, to uh, create any opportunities for that. So to me, uh, what a firm put on paper uh, is a starting point for the negotiations and they should only be moving off that um, in the directions that, that, that we support in terms of our policy direction. Um, with that, uh, I, I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, happy to second that. Member Bush and then we'll go to Member Hall. Uh, yes, um, uh, a couple questions to staff. Um, I didn't hear mention of the Surplus Lands Act and I believe it doesn't apply because this is a long-term 100 year lease, is that correct? Um, no, it would still apply, but we complied with it. So back in uh, 2020, we declared this property surplus and issued the required notices. And at that time, we didn't get a notice of interest within the 60-day time frame. And so under HCD's rules, um, then this property has been cleared, and we were free to then default back to our normal process. Got it. And is that actually for all of our properties? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. News to me. Thank you. Good advantage. Um, so my other question um, was on the um, the outreach to in the involvement of the city of La Mesa. So we heard, um, you know, you spoke to uh, Council Member Dillard. I will disclose I went to uh, last week, it was League of Cities training. And so I got to speak and talk to her and she brought up um, a project, an affordable housing project. I didn't realize it was on, the project she was talking about was MTS, yeah. uh, was this project because she did make uh, a comment, just full disclosure about um, her concern with the studio units. Um, and so my question that just brings it up overall, because I think um, this is within the city of La Mesa. So we wanna, you know, defer to them, but at the same time, maximize the financial advantage for this organization. So it's like a balance of needs. What has been the outreach to the city of La Mesa? Do we um, have, have they had any uh, public discussions or recommendations of this project? Uh, does this project require any approval process with the city of La Mesa? Uh, so I believe this would be a, a ministerial project. Most of the developers, you know, are, are crafting their project to be ministerial. Um, I have had, um, I did talk with Council Member Dillard um, while she was at that um, conference, you know, so she, she called and kind of laid out that after our first briefing, she had a, had additional kind of thoughts on the project and things that she wanted to better understand or see if it could be incorporated. You know, one of those ones was, you know, a concern is, is 50 studios too many? And so, you know, we did commit that during the negotiation process with the firm, we would, you know, do our due diligence on that. You know, I don't know if, you know, the reasons are because of how they're doing their funding, that there's a certain mix. And so that's a conversation we'll have. And, you know, we also committed to, you know, she also wanted us to look into um, solar so that, you know, it factors into some of the city's, you know, climate action plans. She did have questions that she feels like this actually is a very walkable neighborhood and what would we do to incorporate? And then she was interested in what some of the ground floor commercial uses would be. And so we committed to kind of consulting with her, having developer meet with her throughout that process so that, you know, her input of knowing what her city really wants, you know, can go into this. We have not had any discussions yet with, with city management, but would expect that during the actual negotiation process, um, that we would engage with them. And then I also, um, you know, Council Member Dillard, you know, expressed an interest that she thought that um, Council Member Parent would all, uh, for the city of La Mesa Colin Parent would also be a valuable resource. And so, you know, we've committed to kind of briefing and, you know, the two of them throughout this process. And yeah. just to add on to that, also in the La Mesa uh, Transit Oriented Development Study, there was a lot of uh, community outreach happened during COVID. So they, they had, you know, challenges of trying to, you know, reach out to the various community members. But um, we made sure that uh, all three proposers were very well aware that this was out there. And this is something that the city had spent a lot of time and effort on. And so we wanted to make sure that those recommendations were incorporated. And that was one of the things we kind of liked about the affirm proposal that they did, you know, try and, uh, you know, align their proposal to uh, the some of the responses that came back in the La Mesa Transit Oriented Development Study. Okay, so at this point, is this proposal, is it fair to say this proposal is consistent with uh, the city of La Mesa's, I don't know if it's a specific plan area or general plan, this project? Or we don't know that yet? Uh, we're gonna go through and bet that, yeah. but- it, it seems, seems generally yes. to align, but we haven't you know, done a super deep dive. And that would be one of the things during this um, negotiation process that we would confirm. Uh, the one thing I guess to add on that 
I maybe jumped over Sean when we were doing the first presentation of the next steps, but on the parking issue, you know, our thoughts here, while the affirmed proposal has the lowest amount of transit parking replacement, you know, we felt that we've, we've got the MTS parking study that the board approved that is going on right now. We're expecting that draft report sometime in March. And so it, it would align with like, we don't know, is 63 enough spaces? Is it too much? Is it not enough? And that we would take the results of that parking study that the board has commissioned and then feed that into deciding, you know, that issue and negotiating that further. So kind of that was our plan on, on evaluating the parking amount. A, a couple other comments on that. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so just, I kind of wanted to give some of my thoughts on, on some of these individual items and I imagine, and I do support staff recommendation and the motion. Um, and so, and um, for oh, so for the reasons that were that were mentioned, um, the bet the bedroom count is huge. Uh, uh, that's really key and important. Um, where I see conflicts with potentially the city of La Mesa, as you brought up, uh, Council Member Dillard, and so I think this is where you know the negotiation part comes in. But studios, like you know, I think us is you know, was there a direction given to that? There might be some opposition to studios. I could say from my um, perspective, I think they're a needed mix and that in our um, in the last 10, 20, uh, 30 years, a lot of the single room occupancy in studios that we've had, particularly in downtown, but this is, you know, uh, La Mesa, um, they, those have been lost and that's actually contributed a lot to the homelessness crisis. And so uh, I, studios are, are, are a big part um, and families, family units. So three bedroom are important too. And this proposal has the most of those, I think distinct um, unit mixes that the market isn't necessarily providing or doesn't provide all the time. And, um, and but there's a need for it. So, so that's one of like my favorite things, <clears throat> excuse me, about the affirm proposal. Um, the other item you brought up parking and I, um, you know, we have a housing crisis, not a parking crisis. And I'm glad that the MTS studies show that this one be, you know, be a huge impact, but there does have to be sacrifices made. Um, if we're going to address the housing and the homelessness crisis and parking has to be that sacrifice. It's we ideally we'd have all the parking we could, we don't live in that world. Parking is expensive. Um, and it doesn't also help us with all of our climate action plan goals that we have to achieve. So um, it's it's a difficult discussion, uh, you know, with the community about parking, but it's a it's an uncomfortable, difficult discussion. We I, I think we have to frame properly. And so I, I, I again I appreciate um, staff being continue to be bold and uh, and and prioritize housing over over parking. And um, yeah, and then just all the other items I think are good. Uh, the the final um, question I had or, or comment uh, is following up with a council member Whitburn or Vice Chair Whitburn. Excuse me, I thought he had some. A good points. Um, so, uh, so in that uh, back and forth, the, um, I, the if we were to open up uh, back up uh, into more, um, you know, negotiation with the others, my fear is that it would just delay some items. But I, I do hear you, uh, Vice Chair, about you know just making clear that the other developers they'll have like you know a fair opportunity. So maybe it, so. Um, I think if, if if you had um you know for for you know the next project if we want to have a set time frame but I, I think there has to be a set time frame instead of too much back and forth because then it just gets us down into um you know it doesn't end up being fair and it delays and I think the 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 real value here is that th this is a really quick um fairly quick process so we have a housing crisis now and this is really efficient thank you uh member hall mine's gonna be real quick you kind of answered it about the parking i'm i'm Councilmember Bush uh, um, mentioned uh, that we need to give it up. I kind of like to park, would like to see more parking if we could, uh, but you know, that's a negotiation thing. So, you know, whatever you can do. Um, and I mean, you know, I'd be tending, we, we've done this with the studio. They just, um, I think the one bedroom would be a little more advantageous. We can work on those figures, but you know, again, these are, those were just not it. So you, you kind of covered it already, so it's not a problem. Thank you. Thank you for, for all the work. I, I, oh, sure. well, of course, go I, ahead. I, I apologize, question. Chair. One more thing I forgot to mention. Uh, I was gonna ask staff, could we potentially look at ne a negotiation as a topic, um, The making the developer uh, provide subsidized uh, transit passes for everyone, or is that is that negotiation, can, can we ask? Um, I mean, we certainly can have that as a discussion. The subsidized transit passes, you know, are like often expensive, but I think lots of our board members in the, or lots of our developers 
in the funding process are looking at grant opportunities to incorporate that. And so I think that that is becoming something that's more common, that one of the things that they can get when they go out and seek some of the grants to build these is to get a grant to fund maybe the first year of a transit pass, you know, that it opens to try to encourage people to ride. And so that's, that's something we've had those ongoing discussions. I just don't know how successful they've been and when they know if they would have that funding, you know. I would just ask that we would make that a negotiation topic because um, to help mitigate for the parking loss, then that makes sense. And then there's more riders for us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good point. Um, I went out to this site sometime back uh, with the Lumis council member and uh, there's a lot of housing in the area. I, I think this could be, could be, uh, I think the point around making sure folks can still, who don't live there can still access it and we make it easier is a, is a really good one uh, to make sure we incorporate that, that in. Um, I appreciate, Sean, the delineation between the headline of the number of units compared to the number of bodies that can actually live there. Um, you know, what I'm interested in is how many people can have a home uh, and a place to go. And so I think it's easy to get distracted by the number of units versus the bedroom counts. Um, in terms of the spread, you know, we, we can work on that. I mean, you know, you can maximize the space. Studios are going to be more affordable for a lot of folks. Um, it is going to be much more affordable. And for some folks, that's going to be the best that they can do. And so I know at times there can be reluctance to that, but I, I, I kind of like that. I mean, it's providing a range of, uh, of options for folks and what they need. Uh, some folks don't need a two bedroom or a three bedroom or even one bedroom. Um, and uh, so we have a, such a critical shortage. Um, I think that's important. Um, the parking issue, look, we, we are going to continue to wrestle with this for some time. Um, every time I've been out there, uh, I'm struck by how incredibly empty it is, even at peak times, which is perhaps why we're building housing there. Uh, but, you know, figuring out what is that right number uh, on the range from where we are to folks who say there should be no parking. I think we're going to land the plane and, and figure it out as, as best and appropriate uh, we can, again, with the prioritization on more housing, more people, which will increase our ridership as well. Um, I do like the uh, restrooms. We've struggled as a board to figure out how we can have publicly accessible restrooms at our transit stops, and perhaps we're on to something here uh, with a way we can do that. And I think that being incorporated here, uh, not just the construction, but the ongoing maintenance and security uh, is going to uh, lift a heavy load off of us. And so the developer being willing to incorporate that in is good. And then the last thing I'll just say is I am very mindful of uh, comments Eloy Rivera, uh, member Eloy Rivera made around um, if we go into exclusive negotiations and we show up and all of a sudden the bathroom's not affordable anymore, that's going to be a problem. Uh, and so we are, there is an expectation uh, that we will work and, and every developer knows some things will get added along the way and people will have ideas and we'll negotiate through that and work through that as best we can. Um, but I, I would, uh, would echo what you said. It would cause grave concern uh, to sort of show up when we enter into new exclusive negotiation, all of a sudden, the things we like about this and we didn't like about the others start to fade away, uh, which might entice us to, to want to take another look at, at perhaps starting over again. But I, I suspect that won't be the case as we move forward. And then the last thing I'll just say is we're all aware, uh, invariably in any jurisdiction you go, uh, there will uh, be 264 people uh, who after this is done will think this was the greatest thing that we ever did uh, because they will have a home and a, and a bedroom and a place to live. Uh, my guess is there will be an equal or higher number of people in the process to get here who do not think it's such a good idea um, and those surrounding residents. And we just have to endure uh, through that uh, to make sure that we don't just continue to whittle away um, out from opposition from people who already have a home, uh, who don't want anyone else to have a home. And uh, and so I'm mindful of that and what we deal with every day. So with that, we have a motion and a second uh, not seeing any additional uh, comments or requests to speak. All in favor of advancing this to the board, or I'm sorry, uh, to authorize uh, to execute an exclusive negotiating contract, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstain? That motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I just would note, thank you, the we're, we're starting to keep this chart that we're going to bring every time, which is the unit. Right now, it's still under units that we've approved, you know, and uh, as we've gone through this, we've really decided you can play games with unit numbers, and so we might convert it to bedrooms, but it really shows, you know, that we've got over, you know, 3,000 um, units, you know, 1,400 of them are all restricted um, units, and actually, you know, 600 of those were before we started this new policy. So like MTS's, you know, TOD program is kind of going gangbusters and they're all in the pipeline right now. So it'll be exciting over the next five years as they actually open and people are able to live in them. Awesome. Chair, just really quickly, 
this is fantastic. If I could just ask, and this is, it's, it's small, but I think it's important. We refer to these as homes, not units, because they, they are homes and, and it, a home is a life changing thing for someone and a unit is like just a thing on a, on a Excel sheet. So thank you. Point. Good point, point thank one second. All right, thank you all. We're gonna go to uh, item number eight, informational item only, one that's been uh, quite a while uh, in the making and uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Dennis. Good morning, Dennis Desmond, Director of Planning and Scheduling. I'm talking this morning about two different services. Uh, one is an upcoming Iris Rapid um, service that will be opening later this fall, and the other is about this Rhino Valley Coaster connection. Uh, we anticipated a public hearing next month for major service changes on both of these, um, but next month's public hearing will actually be for the Iris Rapid only, um, and this hearing is required per Board Policy 42, and I'll explain a little bit more about what's happening with each of these. Iris Rapid is a new rapid bus route that we um, are developing here at MTS. Um, we have a TIRCP state grant um, that's funding the capital side of it. Um, we expect a soft launch in September of 2023. Um, it's a 13-mile route with 10 stations stretching between Otay Mesa and Imperial Beach. Uh, we actually have 12 electric articulated buses, our first articulated electric buses. Um, we expect the first one um, here, the pilot bus, within a week or so, and then the other 11 will come in um, over the next um, three or four months. Um, we'll be running a seven and a half minute frequency between Otay Mesa and Iris um, Trolley Station and 15 minutes um, between on, on the rest of the route um, over to Imperial Beach. Um, it'll be about $3 million out of MTS's operating budget um, to operate this route map of the route just shows that um, the ocean is on the left side of this uh, screen. We have uh, two stops over Long Seacoast Drive and Imperial Beach, and then it follows Imperial Beach Boulevard and Coron Avenue uh, over to 30th Street and down to the Iris Avenue Transit Center, and then uses the 905 freeway with the stop at Caliente, uh, and then into the um, new transit center at Otay Mesa. So it connects with our rapid 225 South Bay rapid route at Otay Mesa, and then with the blue line at Iris Avenue. Uh, the image on the screen now is uh, what our new rapid electric buses will look like. Um, we are excited about the first one coming in in the next few days. Um, so, uh, and again, these are funded by the TIRCP grant, 11 of them, and then another one is funded by um, other state funds. Uh, the image on the screen now is just uh, what the amenities will look like um, at most of the stations along the route. Um, not all of them have the um, ability to have this kind of infrastructure, but uh, this will be the standard for most of the routes. So a nice new shelter, rapid shelter with um, real-time information on a um, message sign and um, lighting uh, and other information, trash receptacles, that kind of thing. Um, so the proposal that will come to the public hearing uh, next month is uh, to implement this uh, new route uh, with the soft launch in September of 2023 uh, to replace Route 950, um, and every stop um, is replaced by Iris Rapid. So while we're discontinuing 950, we're essentially replacing the entire service with Iris Rapid. Um, and then um, some other minor adjustments uh, may be made to some other routes to complement the new service coming in. The second service is the Sereno Valley um, Coaster Connection. Dennis, before you yes, go sir. on, I do want to note that Iris Rapid was an, a fully MTS creation. We've done the, the construction. We've managed the project. We're funding it entirely. Um, this is actually the first rapid that we are doing, not under the auspices of Sandag, but under MTS's own auspices. Um, and I do believe this will be a very successful route as we're seeing on the 905 right now and the 950 that we're actually gonna be taking people, quite a few people um, getting them onto transit. Yeah, and the planning of this actually started about three years ago when we got the state grant 
Um, we did a very, very robust public outreach process. That's actually how we started the whole thing. Um, many, many meetings in the area, um, Imperial Beach, Nestor, uh, Otay West and Otay Mesa, um, getting input from current riders as well as people that might find utility in it that aren't actually riding now. So um, we think it'll be actually a really, really successful and big improvement. There are local services to these areas now. They're slower um, than this will be. So uh, we think this will be a real um, great addition. Uh, Serena Valley Coaster Connection is a series of five routes um, that start at the Serena Valley Coaster Station um, and then uh, distribute folks coming from the coaster to uh, employment areas in Sereno Mesa, um, Carroll Canyon, University City, and uh, Torrey Pines. Um, they operate weekdays, peaks only. We use minibuses um, and uh, services 50% um, funded by North County Transit District. Um, plus they give us a dollar fare for each boarding. Um, it does require five buses for the five routes um, and at least five drivers, they're split shifts. So we have morning peak drivers and then PM peak drivers. Um, and this route, these, the services, all five routes have really struggled um, with the pandemic. Um, ridership is a down, down about 70%, um, has not recovered at the same rate that our other services are. Um, and the, um, all of the metrics are um, much, much lower on this. Our average um, subsidy per passenger ranges between 14 and $22 on these routes versus less than $6 for all of our other fixed routes. Uh, the map on the screen here just shows you the five routes. Um, they're labeled from 972 up to 979. Um, so one is the Sereno Valley, sorry, Sereno Mesa area. Um, one is um, Carroll Canyon. Um, then our 979 connects in with the University City and the trolley stations up there. We have another route that's essentially dedicated to UCSD. Um, UCSD used to operate this. We took it over um, a couple of years ago and then 978 goes up into the Torrey Pines area. Uh, the graph on the screen here shows um, what's happened since the pandemic. Um, so you can see that each of these routes collectively, uh, we actually carried almost 500 passengers on these prior to the pandemic. Um, now um, it, it went down to less than 100 total. Um, now it's gone up to about 150 total, um, but still far below where we were pre-pandemic. Um, here again shows the subsidy per passenger. Uh, we we're actually over $40 per passenger on one of the routes at one time during the um, worst part of the pandemic. Those have come down as ridership has trickled back in, um, but we again are still between $14 and $22 per passenger on these um, services. Uh, we are in discussions with North County Transit District to take over this service uh, next year. Um, this service uh, really um, completely supports the coaster um, and is primarily used by people that um, live along coaster stations in the North County area. So um, while the Serena Valley area is within the MTS jurisdiction, um, it is appropriate for North County to um, operate this since it does support their service and they operate similar type services out of some of their other stations in their area. Um, so those talks are ongoing. Um, however, um, we are struggling um, to cover our service given our um, driver shortage right now um, and dedicating five buses to these routes that are carrying collectively uh, fewer than 150 people is very, very resource intensive for us. Um, so what we're proposing to do in June is to modify some of the routings. Um, I mentioned that this will not be at the public hearing because we think it, um, we'll be able to do these with minor service changes that won't require a public hearing and won't have um, significant impacts on passengers. Um, we may need to have a public hearing at a later date if we decide to do some major changes um, that would require a public hearing under that board policy 42. Um, our target for savings um, is about $180,000 a year. Again, we won't achieve all of that because we'll be transitioning to the service over to NCTD um, by next year. So the other issue to bring up is that the minibus fleet, we use six minibuses on this. Um, they're all um, beyond their useful life. Um, and so uh, they will need to be replaced. Um, the full replacement for that fleet is almost $2 million. So transitioning this to NCTD will also um, transition that away from MTS. So that'll be a cost savings of about $2 million on our capital budget. 
So our public hearing again in March uh, will be for the Iris Rapid um, and the discontinuation of Route 950. Um, the public will have an opportunity to comment both at that meeting, that, that hearing, uh, as well as uh, ahead of time and we'll provide those comments. Um, we'll also have a Title VI uh, service equity analysis um, for the board at that public hearing. Um, and if approved, the uh, IRIS rapid changes will go into effect in September of this year. Um, and again, any major changes to Sereno Valley will be brought to you at a later date. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers in this item? We do. Karina Contreras, please unmute yourself now. Thank you again for this presentation. This is Karina Contreras, Transportation Policy Advocate for Climate Action Campaign. Uh, really excited to see the IRIS Rapid uh, you know, come to fruition. Um, that's gonna be an incredibly important resource for folks to connect uh, from one place to another and quickly. Uh, so I appreciate that, but I do have some comments regarding the Sorrento Valley Coaster Connection. Um, it seems like I keep hearing this theme over and over of bus operator shortage. However, I don't know what the data is on that. On the NCTD side, they're being very transparent about what their shortage looks like. Uh, they continue to update the public in the public record, uh, indicating you know, how many bus operators they're short, how many folks are in training, uh, how many folks they anticipate will complete the training, uh, any shortages on service and mechanic workers, uh, but I haven't seen that on the MTS side. Uh, so I think it's really critical for the public to know exactly uh, what this shortage looks like, uh, because if we are going to you know, connect folks uh, with previous frequencies uh, before COVID and then look to expand the frequencies, we obviously can't do that if there's not enough bus operators. So at least having some kind of understanding of where we're at with our bus operator shortage is, it, it's just critical uh, for this organization um, and for the public to, to see that in a transparent way. Um, I am also curious to see if uh, on in the Sorrento Valley area, uh, if there is a way to build out, you know, low speed, uh, vehicles, a uh, whole network of that. Um, you know, there's quite a few different uh, innovative proposals at the SANDAG level, uh, and perhaps there's a way for in the future uh, low speed vehicles to, to help connect uh, folks uh, with a lower cost. Um, also, I just want to bring up the fact that this area is very close to SR 56. And that entire corridor is really a transit desert. Uh, so being able to connect folks uh, to job centers is critical. Um, and I think that there's, there's a lot of opportunity to be able left. to do that. Thank you. That concludes public comment, Chair. All right. <clears throat> Just an informational item only, Member Moreno. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering why was um, the cross border express not added to the iris rapid? Um, it seemed. Oh, it's on. Yeah. Do you want me to repeat it? My question. Oh. Um, my question was why was uh, the cross border express on the iris rapid um, not included? It seems to me. It doesn't seem to me. I know that there um, isn't any transit public transit available for folks using cross-border express. And with the success of cross-border express, I think that um, MTS should definitely be um, included in the transportation opportunities for folks. Yeah, um, you know, the cross-border express is challenging because of its location. It's so far south of the 905 freeway that um, to, to deviate this iris rapid, um, would probably add 10 to 15 minutes to everybody else's trip. Um, so it's certainly something that could be part of, um, you know, a different route at some point in the future. Um, the CBX itself has um, used contractors to operate different kinds of shuttle services um, from San Ysidro and from the airport. Um, I, I actually have had trouble getting the status of that right now. Um, I know that their previous contractor 
um, decided to stop providing that service and they have another you, one coming I'm sorry, on board. You, you've had trouble getting what information? The, the status of the, the, um, cross, the CBX's shuttle service. They operate some shuttle service using contractors. Yes. Um, and you've had issues, you've requested that information? It was, it was operated by a company called Damaris for a while, and I believe that company has stopped serving it, and they had a El Paso limousine lines was to take that um, service over, but I don't believe they have yet. So it's something that we've talked about since the CBX has, has started, and they've talked to us. Um, they weren't able to offer any funding for us to operate a new route. Um, so I know that Sandag is looking at it as a possible future um, destination in the regional transportation plan for a future rapid services. Um, so I think that's on the timeline, but we don't have any funding for it right now. Got you. And I mean, we have the numbers, right? That they always they always uh, put out publicly right. what their um, yeah what their usage is, um, and we do have city streets out there, so we would not we wouldn't necessarily need their permission, if you will. I mean, it would Correct. be nice to go all the way in. Um, Correct. Thank you so much. But um, but it would be something that I would be greatly interested in. Obviously, it services the tourism industry. Um, it helps with our limited capacity at the airport at Limburg yeah. Field. So I would be interested in seeing um, maybe in the future modifying the Iris Rapid to include it um, and or its own um, its own not its own line, but incorporated into another line. Sure, and we've certainly discussed with them if they had any ability to provide some funding that that would make it easier for us to um, add that in. Well, I don't, if they're not responding, I know it's not them, but if one of their yeah. providers is not responding to us, I don't think we should wait for a response at this point. Right. Um, I think we should just move ahead. Um, it seems that we're always eager to accommodate tourism in the region in San Diego. So I don't see why we wouldn't just go ahead and do it down at the border. Well, I, I do want to caution a bus rapid transit is called rapid because you want to make it as quick as possible for as many patrons as possible. So us deviating off the route for 15 minutes will degrade the experience for our customers on the rapid. Um, but I think what Dennis is saying is that in the future, we might find an opportunity to establish a different route that would not harm the um, the uh, passengers that are using the rapid. No, I, I heard him loud and clear. I just, I would challenge that. Who knows how many riders we would get and if it would add another 10 minutes. I mean, the amount of people crossing that cross-border express is astounding. So I, I would challenge us on that. And I would say, you know, what would happen if we added, how many minutes would it be? how many um, passengers maybe it would benefit the rapid to add the passengers. Maybe the real passengers are at cross border express and not Otay Mesa. I don't know. That's uh, things that I would push back on and see if we can. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but they just keep on hitting the mark. I mean, just by pet, just it's, it's astounding the amount of people that are using CBX and it's only going to grow. They, they're, they have, I believe, two runways down in Tijuana. So uh, it, I think it would behoove MTS to, um, to look into that sooner rather than later. We do have a local route that gets near the CBX. So there's an option of extending that also. Member Bush. Uh, yes, maybe just on what uh, Council Member Moreno was saying, maybe that's an opportunity for um, a future analysis or study because maybe we don't have that information. And I do hear staff's point about, you know, uh, not wanting to add delays. And I think uh, the council member as well. And so maybe that's something, you know, working, looking at workload. I don't know when that's appropriate for staff, but maybe that is something um, for, for future. How, how much would, how long do you think that would take uh, another study of, of um, adding uh, the um, the cro the border or the cross border X. So that's what he's saying is that Sandag studying um, transit to cross border express. So it would be redundant for us to do that, but we can certainly look at options for um, how we might restructure the 905 to accommodate in a shorter term. All right, thank you. Informational item only. Uh, appreciate the uh, presentation. <clears throat> Item nine, let's look at our uh, draft 2016 MTS board agenda. Let me ask if there's any comments or 
questions surrounding what we have on the agenda for our upcoming board meeting, Sharon? I have a potential ad for you. Um, so frequently this body um, recommends that we bring forward times when cities are taking steps to harm um, transit services in their jurisdiction. Um, last night I found out that um, after a year and a half of discussing why it was a mistake um, for the city to do this, they tell us they're moving forward, sorry, the city of San Diego, um, they're moving forward with closing Fifth Avenue from F Street to Broadway. Um, that this will have significant impacts to two of our main routes, uh, the 120, which is a limited express service that's very popular, as well as the Route 3, which actually provides really good transit connectivity from places like Lincoln Park and Sherman Heights and um, other areas that we really want to be able to access the new uh, office space happening at, at uh, Horton Plaza, et cetera. So I would like to add that to the agenda um, with a potential action for this board. Um, I know that the city of San Diego might not take favorably to that, but we're getting nowhere with staff at this point, so. All right, interesting discussion. I'm sure we'll have some good perspective uh, from our city folks there. Um, okay, other staff communication and business? Or uh, communication? Yes, I wanted to communicate one more thing. Um, that is that, uh, so we got a new um, amendment to the agreement with uh, the MOU with Sandag with regard to the youth opportunity pass and it was sent to me to sign um, that would extend it until was it December 31st I think it was December 31st but anyway for whatever reason they've rescinded that and said they can't move forward with it so for those of you interested in the YOP um, you should probably raise that with Sandag I thought we had an agreement um, we really felt we should extend it into the fall since it is a pilot and it really needs to be understood how it's going to, plus it will be very hard for us to communicate this this summer um, when the students are obviously out of school. So I raise that with you as just a public comment or a communication. I will mention it to the Sandag chair. Um, okay, next meeting date, March 9th, 2023. Not seeing anything else, we stand adjourned. Thank you all.